was through that book I got introduced to Montale and um, Rambo and, and, and writers like that, and I, a, a lot of the, a lot of those writers were influences for those poems. Um, kind of you know, move on to you know, more of a thematic question here for a minute. Uh, baseball is also another one of those things that sort of crops up in your work from time to time. And, I'm, and I think particularly with something like uh, the death of the right fielder, which is sort of concerned with its metaphorical qualities. And what metaphorical qualities do, do you see in baseball that you, know, that you want to use, that you, that you do use? Well, I, I, I mean, I think this, that story is self-explanatory as far as <clears throat> what its metaphors are. But what I would, I, I go back to that earlier statement I made about perception. I, for me, sports are one of those doorways. Physical, intense physical activity is one of those doorways that when you enter a sport or enter any intensely physical activity, um, you you are you have again transformed your perception. You're in a different zone, a different world. You know, I mean that. The I, I love the um, the current sports vernacular for being in the zone, because that's exactly kind of what I'm trying to talk about. And so um, clearly, they're in the baseball zone in that story. And <laughs> <laughs> also, I'd say um, you know, in particular with. Uh, struck me is um, in Hot Ice you talk about St. Roberto Clemente um, when Big Attic has his uh, miraculous experience in the background they're talking about uh, Joe DiMaggio right. you know, and those those larger stories baseball still sort of enters into the into well it, it's, the a, it's a, a sport I love though like everybody else I'm disgusted by what's going on right now <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean I you know I spent huge amounts of my life sitting in Wrigley Field and um, the, it, some of the happiest moments. So, um, and and pl and played ball well into my thirties till I tore my knees up. So, <laughs> so that 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 ent that entire American mythology that goes along with it uh, fascinates me. Uh, Clemente himself, I I I really feel is. Um, Probably one of the, besides Fenway Park, uh, one of the two parks in Major League Baseball that still has this almost time machine element when you enter it. And part of it is that <clears throat> we've gotten bigger. The world was smaller when those parks were bought, were, <clears throat> were built. And I have this clear recollection as a kid of sitting in the small ballpark with one of the worst pitching staffs <laughs> in the history of baseball on the mound, that is the Chicago Cubs, and one of the best hitting teams in the history of baseball in the batter's box, the Pittsburgh Pirates, with guys like Stargell and Clemente and several other players, and, and the power of those balls firing off the bats <laughs> and these Cub pitchers lobbing this in in that little park. I mean, it really felt like you, you should be yelling, incoming, incoming. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, and, and so I think that's the, t I mean, you, you just can't really, uh, you can only uh, suggest but not ever really capture the power of a Roberto Clemente line drive coming off a ball and a bat in Ridley Field. So I, that, that kind of, uh, there's always that homage to him in those, in those references. He, he was absolutely one of my favorite players, and, and, I, and I never saw a better player in the field, ever. I mean, Willie Mays was, I saw Willie Mays play a lot, and I, I thought Clemente at his peak was, uh, was about as good as Mays. Are, are you still able to keep that kind of innocent wonderment about no. baseball? No, you I'm lost not. It? No, I'm not. I've lost it. Is it just because of the recent occurrences in baseball, or is it just part of growing up? Probably both, but I think when I really lost it was when Wrigley Field became a yuppie hangout. <laughs> <laughs> because the Wrigley Field I loved was, I was a caseworker for a couple of years, and I 
you know, I, I mean, I, if it's somehow possible to do penance and apologize to those ADC mothers <laughs> whose doors I pounded on at 8 o'clock in the morning so that I could get my calls done early and get out to the ballpark by one <laughs> I do. Whatever pants there is, I'd like to do it now. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can walk in off the street and buy a ticket and, and sit in the back seats. And I, I mean, it's just changed so much. It's become this place where to get a good tick, a good seat, you've got to know a CEO. And uh, and, and and I in fact know a few, and I take advantage of it. <laughs> but that, I mean, it's, it, it's just changed so dramatically from this um, place where kids could, could come from the different ethnic neighborhoods on the bus and go to, to, to something people use as business write-offs. And, and, you know, if they ever tear that ballpark down, the reason they'll do it is because they, it doesn't have the kinds of skyboxes that make everybody the, kind, the kinds of money. And, and it, it's that aspect that finally has become impossible for me to ignore anymore. And uh, one, once it wormed its way into um, the, the entire context of the game, it, it, it let lessen the game for me, I guess. It, it, but clearly, it one's naive. You know, when you see a, a, a movie like John Sayles, a uh, movie about the Chicago Black, so Black Sox, Eight Men Out. <clears throat> it, it probably always should have been integrated in the sport, what the uh, economic conditions of, of it was. Okay, well, I'm going to take this opportunity to turn it over to the audience to ask questions of Mr. Dygrak. It always seemed to me that one of the awfulest aspects of the Cubs mystique in Wrigley Field is that they've reached a point now where winning and making money are no longer connected. They don't even care if they can construct winning teams anymore, as long as, as long as the ballpark is filled up with people, with families uh, during the afternoons. And the separation of winning from, from uh, the, the value of the franchise seems to me to be a dreadful thing. Well, it's, it's true, although I, even before that place became yuppified, it was a weird Chicago tradition to lose. <laughs> I mean, I would feel it sometimes in handball games. I'd have this guy. I mean, I'd have him by eight, nine points, and I would almost feel this obligation to fold, you know? <laughs> in, lieu, in lieu of a religious yeah. you know, principle. But, but I mean, what, what, clearly what's happened in Chicago is Wrigley Field is cute. And everybody goes to sit in this cute ballpark, and it's it's uh, it, it's true there isn't there isn't this it's not a part of a tradition, and I, I don't suppose it's part of a commitment. <laughs> Nevertheless, some of the scab players, if they do play, will will look okay in Wrigley Field. Yeah, they <laughs> do. <laughs> yeah, they sure will. When you write a synopsis to send in to uh, agents, are they more interested in the summary? They want you to bring in the emotional aspects of your story. Well, you, you really don't write a synopsis of short stories. I'm talking about a novel. A novel? If you haven't published a novel before, they'll be asking for more than a synopsis. They'll be asking at least for three chapters and a synopsis. To get it back to a, I guess, maybe more lyrical sort of question, I noticed when I was looking at your work in the wee hours this morning um, that you use quotations with involving bread in, in both the coast of Chicago and also in childhood and other neighborhoods. One's from Rilke and the other, I guess, is folkloric. And I was wondering um, if you were aware of that. And I wanted to know more about your Eastern European ancestry, which is what I've inferred is your main ethnic group? Yeah, it, yeah, it is. Um, I, I, until you mentioned it, I never noticed it. The, what language oh, is oh, that? What world were you doing up in the wee hours thinking about Perfect. bread, though? So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I'm up in the wee hours, I'm not thinking about bread. <laughs> well, I, I, studied, I studied a little Russian. I remember that um, 
hospitality in Russia is bread and salt. And I was thinking about bread and the flash fiction by Margaret Atwood. What I was doing was trying to prepare myself for your visit. <laughs> <laughs> but I was interested in that folkloric epigraph. I wanted to know, because my father is from Poland. I'm first generation American. Uh -huh. Well, that, um, I got that. Uh, that It's not really folkloric. Uh, this guy, uh, Slovakia, is actually a, a famous Polish poet. And the name wasn't on it, so I didn't Yeah, it's, it's, uh, his name is uh, Julius Slovakia, and I <clears throat> just murdered the pronunciation of his, of his first name. But um, it's, it's from a poem called My Testament. And um, it's, it's kind of a, one of the mainstays of Polish poetry. So that's where I took that. But because, I, I mean, in, in the, uh, because I knew I wanted to dedicate this book to my brothers uh, who understood a lot of the, who would have understood a lot of the experiences I was drawing upon, which was our ethnic background, I was basically just looking for this, for a, a kind of a, a uh, epigraph in the language that we grew up hearing to, to say this to them in. And I, I found that one, and until you talked about that bread thing, it never occurred to me for a second. So, But um, the, the two main ethnic groups in the neighborhood I grew up in were Polish or Eastern European, a lot of Czech and a lot of uh, Bohemian and Slovak and uh, um, a scattering of others, and also Mexican. And so the languages that I heard besides English were Spanish and Polish. And um, somebody else pointed this out to me. I mean, it never occurred to me, but that in a lot of my stories, which just happened uh, naturally because of the ethnic groups, in a lot of my stories, there is this Hispanic character, and then there's a Polish character or a Czech character. And that a lot of the influences for the writing are these Hispanic writers and these Eastern European writers. And the epigraphs, the, one of the epigraphs is from Machado, which it, who is maybe my favorite Spanish poet. And then the other epigraph is from Slovakia, who is the Polish poet. You know, so I mean, so it forms this kind of neat little symmetry, which is actually pretty accidental, but does in fact match the neighborhood I grew up in. You uh, you read a lot of contemporary uh, Eastern European writers, uh, people who are still around. Sure. Yeah. Any names pop out? Well, I, I know you guys had uh, Shesvon Mibosh here, and he was he's he's long been one of my favorite poets. But um, God um. I'm not drawing a name. Uh, there, there's a wonderful Jewish uh, Polish writer. Um, what's, his, what's his name? Uh, something about cockroaches. Do you, do you, do you, do you know that? Yeah. You did? Yeah, I, I love that guy's work. Um, uh, you know, just the, and I love a lot of the Czech writers. Uh, Kundara is. You know, everybody's favorite. He's certainly one of my favorites. Um, a lot of the uh, the Czech poets. So, um, just kind of the whole range of them. Have you been to Poland recently? I know no. Tom Russell was there um, recently. I was wondering if you, you've never been to Poland. Mm -hmm. Do you have a desire? To All my family is gone. So Poland? Yeah. But I, I, yes, I do. Yeah, I, I almost took a Fulbright there, and something else came up. And, uh, I, I, did, I didn't go that particular way. Yes, maybe just one last question. Then, uh, in your introduction to Chicago Stories, which is a collection of works by Chicago writers, you uh, you mentioned the blues or credit the blues as being an influence on the uh, on that style. So. Uh, here we are in Memphis, which is 
recognizes the official home of the blues. I think an yeah. act of Congress declared it. So, yeah. so uh, you see a similar aesthetic working. A, a similar aesthetic working between Chicago and Memphis. Um, <laughs> like mm. the blues and stuff. Yeah. Well, I never <laughs> thought about that. I, I certainly, I certainly have always uh, availed myself of all the blues clubs in the city. <laughs> But as far as uh, in the writing, I don't know. I'd have to, that's a great question, but I'd have to think about it a little bit more. Okay. Yes. One more question? Yes, that's it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Please come this evening, 8 o'clock.